Preface of Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Greenman. Mark Twain by Archibald Henderson. Haply, who knows, somewhere in Avalon, Isle of Dreams, in vast contentment at last, with every grief done away, while Chaucer and Shakespeare wait, and Moliere hangs on his words, and Cervantes not far off listens and smiles apart, with that incomparable drawl, he is jesting with Dagonet now. Bliss Carmen preface there are to-day all over the world men and women and children who owe a debt of almost personal gratitude to mark twain for the joy of his humor and the charm of his personality in the future they will i doubt not seek and welcome opportunities to acknowledge that debt my own experience with the works of mark twain is in no sense exceptional from the days of early childhood my feeling for mark twain derived first solely from acquaintance with his works was a feeling of warm and as it were personal affection with limitless interest and curiosity i used to hear the uncle remus stories from the lips of one of our old family servants a negro to whom i was devotedly attached these stories were narrated to me in the negro dialect with such perfect naturalness and racial gusto that I often secretly wondered if the narrator were not Uncle Remus himself in disguise. I was thus cunningly prepared, coached, shall I say, for the maturer charms of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. With Uncle Remus and Mark Twain as my preceptors, I spent the days of my youth excitedly alternating, spellbound, between the inexhaustible attractions of Tom, Huck, Jim, Indian Joe, the duke and the dauphin and their compeers on the one hand and brer rabbit sis cow and a thousand other fantastic but very real creatures of the animal kingdom on the other i felt a strange sort of camaraderie of personal attachment for mark twain during all the years before i came into personal contact with him it was the dictum of a distinguished english critic to the effect that huckleberry finn was a literary masterpiece which first awoke in me then a mere boy a genuine respect for literary criticism for here was expressed an opinion which i had long secretly cherished but somehow never dared to utter my personal association with mr clemens comparatively brief though it was an ocean voyage meetings here and there a brief stay as a guest in his home gave me at last the justification for paying the debt which with the years had grown greater and more insistently obligatory i felt both relief and pleasure when he authorized me to pay that debt by writing an interpretation of his life and work it is an appreciation originating in the heart of one who loved mark twain's works for a generation before he ever met samuel l clemens it is an interpretation springing from the conviction that mark twain was a great american who comprehensively incorporated and realized his own country and his own age as no american has so completely done before him a supreme humorist who ever wore the panache of youth gaiety and bonhomie a brilliant wit who never dipped his darts in the poison of cynicism misanthropy or despair constitutionally a reformer who heedless of self boldly struck for the right as he saw it a philosopher and sociologist who intuitively understood the secret springs of human motive and impulse and empirically demonstrated that intuition in works which crossed frontiers survived translation and went straight to the human beneath the disguise of the racial a genius who lived to know and enjoy the happy rewards of his own fame a great man who saw life steadily and saw it whole archibald henderson london august fifth nineteen ten note the author esteems himself in the highest degree fortunate in having the cooperation of mr alvin langdon coburn all the illustrations both autochrome and monochrome are the work of mr coburn 
Contents Section 1. Introductory Section 2. The Man Section 3. The Humorist Section 4. World-famed genius. Section 5. Philosopher, moralist, sociologist. I've a theory that every author, while living, has a projection of himself, a sort of idolon, that goes about in near and distant places and makes friends and enemies for him out of folk who never knew him in the flesh. When the author dies, this phantom fades away not caring to continue business at the old stand then the dead writer lives only in the impression made by his literature this impression may grow sharper or fainter according to the fashions and new conditions of the time letter of thomas bailey aldridge to william dean howells of date december twenty third nineteen o one end of preface Section One of Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain by Archibald Henderson. Section One. Introductory. In the past, the attitude of the average American toward Mark Twain has been most characteristically expressed in a sort of complacent and chuckling satisfaction. There was pride in the thought that America, the colossal, had produced a superman of humor the national vanity was touched when the nations of the world rocked and roared with laughter over the comically primitive barbarisms of the funny man from the wild and woolly west mark twain was lightly accepted as an international comedian magically evoking the laughter of a world it would be a misstatement to affirm that the works of mark twain were reckoned as falling within the charmed circle of literature they were not reckoned in connection with literature at all the fingers of one hand number those who realized in mark twain one of the supreme geniuses of our age even in the event of his death when the floodgates of critical chatter have been thrown emptily wide there is room for grave doubt whether a realization of the unique and incomparable position of mark twain in the republic of letters has fully dawned upon the american consciousness the literatures of england and europe do not posit an aesthetic embracing work of such primitive crudity and apparently unstudied frankness as the work of mark twain it is for american criticism to posit this more comprehensive aesthetic and to demonstrate that the work of mark twain is the work of a great artist it would be absurd to maintain that mark twain's appeal to posterity depends upon the dicta of literary criticism it would be absurd to deny that upon america rests the task of demonstrating to a world willing enough to be convinced that mark twain is one of the supreme and imperishable glories of american literature at any given moment in history the number of living writers to whom can be attributed what a frenchman would call mondial eclat is surprisingly few it was not so many years ago that rudyard kipling with vigorous imperialistic note won for himself the unquestioned title of militant spokesman for the anglo-saxon race that fame has suffered eclipse in the passage of time today bernard shaw has a fame more world-wide than that of any other literary figure in the british isles his dramas are played from madrid to helsingfors from budapest to stockholm from vienna to st petersburg from berlin to buenos aires recently zola ibsen and tolstoy constituted the literary hierarchy of the world according to popular verdict since zola and ibsen have passed from the scene tolstoy experts unchallenged the profoundest influence upon the thought and consciousness of the world this is an influence streaming less from his works than from his life less from his intellect than from his conscience the literati bemoan the artist of an epoch prior to what is art the whole world pays tribute to the passionate integrity of tolstoy's moral aspiration while this book was going through the press 
news had come of the death of tolstoy until yesterday mark twain vied with tolstoy for the place of most widely read and most genuinely popular author in the world in a sense not easily understood mark twain has a place in the minds and hearts of the great mass of humanity throughout the civilized world which if measured in terms of affection sympathy and spontaneous enjoyment is without a parallel the robust nationalism of kipling challenges the defiant opposition of foreigners whilst his repertorial realism offends many an inviolable canon of european taste with all his incandescent wit and comic irony bernard shaw makes his most vivid impression upon the upper strata of society his legendary character moreover is perpetually standing in the light of the serious reformer tolstoy's works are russia's greatest literary contribution to posterity and yet his literary fame has suffered through his extravagant ideals the magnificent futility of his inconsistency and the almost maniacal mysticism of his unrealizable hopes if mark twain makes a more deeply more comprehensively popular appeal it is doubtless because he makes use of the universal solvent of humor that eidolon of which aldrich speaks a compact of good humor robust sanity and large-minded humanity has diligently gone about in near and distant places everywhere making warm and lifelong friends of folk of all nationalities who have never known mark twain in the flesh the french have a way of speaking of an author's public as if it were a select and limited segment of the conglomerate of readers and in a country like france with its innumerable literary cliques and sects there is some reason for the phraseology in reality the author appeals to many different publics or classes of readers in proportion to the many-sidedness of the reader's human interests and the catholicity of his tastes mark twain first opens the eyes of many a boy to the power of the great human book warm with the actuality of experience and the life-blood of the heart by humorous inversion he points the sound moral and vivifies the right principle for the youth to whom the dawning consciousness of morality is the first real psychological discovery of life with hearty laughter at the stupid irritations of self-conscious virtue with ironic scorn for the frigid puritanism of mechanical morality mark twain enraptures that innumerable company of the sophisticated who have chafed under the omnipresent influence of a good example and stilled the painless pangs of an unruly conscience with splendid satire for the base with shrill condemnation for tyranny and oppression with the scorpion lash for the equivocal the fraudulent and the insincere mark twain inspires the growing body of reformers in all countries who would remedy the ills of democratic government with the knife of publicity the wisdom of human experience and of sagacious tolerance in forming his books for the young provokes the question whether these books are not more apposite to the tastes of experienced age than to the fancies of callow youth the navvy may rejoice in life on the mississippi youth and age may share without jealousy the abounding fun and primitive naturalness of huckleberry finn true lovers of adventure may revel in the masterly narrative of tom sawyer the artist may bestow his critical meed of approval upon the beauty of joan of arc the moralist may heartily validate the ethical lesson of the man that corrupted hadleyburg any one may pay the tribute of irresistible explosions of laughter to the horseplay of roughing it the colossal extravagance of the innocents abroad the irreverence and iconoclism of that yankee intruder into the hallowed confines of camelot all may rejoice in the spontaneity and refreshment of truth spiritually cooperate in forthright condemnation of fraud peculation and sham and breathe gladly the fresh and bracing air of sincerity sanity and wisdom the stevedore on the dock the motorman on the street-car the newsboy on the street 
the river man on the mississippi all speak with exuberant affection in memory of that quaint figure in his white suit his ruddy face shining through wreaths of tobacco smoke and surmounted by a great halo of silvery hair in one day as mark twain was fond of relating an emperor and a portee vied with each other in tributes of admiration and esteem for this man and his works it is mark twain's imperishable glory not simply that his name is the most familiar of that of any author who has lived in our own times but that it is remembered with infinite irrepressible zest we think of mark twain not as other celebrities but as the man whom we knew and loved said dr van dyke in his memorial address we remember the realities which made his life worth while the strong and natural manhood that was in him the depth and tenderness of his affections his laughing enmity to all shams and pretenses his long and faithful witness to honesty and fair dealing those who know the story of mark twain's career know how bravely he faced hardships and misfortune how loyally he toiled for years to meet a debt of conscience following the injunction of the new testament to provide not only things honest but things honorable in the sight of all men those who know the story of his friendships and his family life know that he was one who loved much and faithfully even unto the end those who know his work as a whole know that under the lambent and irrepressible humor which was his gift there was a foundation of serious thoughts and noble affections and desires nothing could be more false than to suppose that the presence of humor means the absence of depth and earnestness there are elements of the unreal the absurd the ridiculous in this strange incongruous world which must seem humorous even to the highest mind of these the bible says he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh the almighty shall hold them in derision but the mark of this higher humor is that it does not laugh at the weak the helpless the true the innocent only at the false the pretentious the vain the hypocritical mark twain himself would be the first to smile at the claim that his humor was infallible but we say without doubt that he used his gift not for evil but for good the atmosphere of his work is clean and wholesome he made fun without hatred he laughed many of the world's false claimants out of court and entangled many of the world's false witnesses in the net of ridicule in his best books and stories colored with his own experiences he touched the absurdities of life with penetrating but not unkindly mockery and made us feel somehow the infinite pathos of life's realities no one can say that he ever failed to reverence the purity the frank joyful genuine nature of the little children of whom christ said of such is the kingdom of heaven now he is gone and our thoughts of him are tender grateful proud we are glad of his friendship glad that he expressed so richly one of the great elements in the temperament of america glad that he has left such an honorable record as a man of letters and glad also for his own sake that after many and deep sorrows he is at peace and we trust 
happy in the fuller light rest after toil port after stormy seas death after life doth greatly please we cannot live always on the cold heights of the sublime the thin air stifles i have forgotten who said it we cannot flush always with the high ardor of the signers of the declaration nor remain at the level of the address at gettysburg nor cry continually o oh, beautiful my country yet in the long dull interspans between these sacred moments we need some one to remind us that we are a nation for in the dead vast and middle of the years insidious foes are lurking anemic refinements cosmopolitan decadencies the egotistic and usurping pride of great cities the cold sickening of the heart at the reiterated exposures of giant fraud and corruption when our countrymen migrate because we have no kings or castles we are thankful to any one who will tell us what we can count on when they complain that our soil lacks the humanity essential to great literature we are grateful even for the firing of a national joke heard round the world and when mark twain robust big-hearted gifted with the divine power to use words makes us all laugh together builds true romances with prairie fire and western clay and shows us that we are at one on all the main points we feel that he has been appointed by providence to see to it that the precious ordinary self of the republic shall suffer no harm stuart p sherman mark twain the nation may twelfth nineteen ten end of introductory This is section two of Mark Twain by Archibald Henderson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Greenman. The Man, Part One. American literature, indeed I might say American life, can exhibit no example of supreme success from the humblest beginnings so signal as the example of Mark Twain. Lincoln became President of the United States, as did Grant and Johnson but assassination began for lincoln an apotheosis which has gone to deplorable lengths of hero worship and adulation grant was one of the great failures in american public life and johnson brilliant but unstable narrowly escaped impeachment mark twain enjoys the unique distinction of exhibiting a progressive development a deepening and broadening of forces a ripening of intellectual and spiritual powers from the beginning to the end of his career from the standpoint of the man of letters the evolution of mark twain from a journeyman printer to a great author from a merry andrew to a world humorist from a river pilot to a trustworthy navigator on the vast and uncharted seas of human experience may be taken as symbolic of the romance of american life with a sort of mock pride clemens referred at times to the ancestral glories of his house the judge who condemned charles i and all those other notables of dutch and english breeds who shed lustre upon the name of clemens yet he claimed that he had not examined into these traditions chiefly because i was so busy polishing up this end of the line and trying to make it showy his mother a lampton with a p of kentucky married john marshall clemens of virginia a man of determination and force in lexington in eighteen twenty three but neither was endowed with means and their life was of the simplest from jamestown in the mountain solitudes of east tennessee they removed in eighteen twenty nine much as judge hawkins is said to have done in the gilded age settling at florida missouri 
Here he was born on November 30th, 1835, a few months after their arrival. Samuel Langhorne Clemens. Long afterwards he stated that he had increased by one per cent the population of this village of one hundred inhabitants, thereby doing more than the best man in history has ever done for any other town. Although weak and sickly, the child did not suffer from the hard life, and survived two other children, Margaret and Benjamin. At different times his life was in danger, the local doctor always coming to the rescue. He once asked his mother, after she had reached old age, if she hadn't been uneasy about him. She admitted she had been uneasy about him the whole time. But when he inquired further if she was afraid he would not live, she answered, after a reflective pause, as if thinking out the facts, that she had been afraid he would. His sister Pamela afterwards became the mother of Samuel E. Moffat, the writer, and his brother Orion, ten years his senior, afterwards was intimately associated with him in life and found a place in his writings. In 1839 John Marshall Clemens tired of the unpromising life of Florida and removed to Hannibal, Missouri. He was a stern, unbending man, a lawyer by profession, a merchant by vocation. After his removal to Hannibal he became a justice of the peace an office he filled with all the dignity of a local autocrat. His forum was a dingy office, furnished with a dry-goods box, three or four rude stools, and a puncheon bench. The solemnity of his manner in administering the law won for him, among his neighbors, the title of judge. One need but recall the scenes in which Tom Sawyer was born and bred to realize in its actuality the model from which these scenes were drawn. "'Sam was always a good-hearted boy,' his mother once remarked, "'but he was a very wild and mischievous one, and, do what we would, we could never make him go to school. This used to trouble his father and me dreadfully, and we were convinced that he would never amount to as much in the world as his brothers, because he was not near so steady and sober-minded as they were.' At school he excelled only in spelling. Outside of school he was the prototype of his own Huckleberry Finn, mischievous and prankish, playing truant whenever the opportunity afforded. Often his father would start him off to school, his mother once said, and in a little while would follow him to ascertain his whereabouts. There was a large stump on the way to the schoolhouse and Sam would take his position behind that, and as his father went past, would gradually circle around it in such a way as to keep out of sight. Finally his father and the teacher both said it was of no use to try to teach Sam anything, because he was determined not to learn. But I never gave up. He was always a great boy for history, and could never get tired of that kind of reading. But he hadn't any use for schoolhouses and textbooks. Mr. Howells has aptly described Hannibal as a loafing, out-at-elbows, down-at-the-heels, slave-holding Mississippi River town. Young Clemens accepted the institution of slavery as a matter of course, for his father was a slave-owner, and his mother's wedding dowry consisted in part of two or three slaves. Judge Clemens was a very austere man. Like so many other slave-holders, he silently abhorred slavery. To his children, especially to Sam, as well as to his slaves, he was, however, a stern taskmaster. Mark Twain has described the terms on which he and his father lived as a sort of armed neutrality. If at times this neutrality was broken and suffering ensued, the breaking and the suffering were always divided up with strict impartiality between them, his father doing the breaking and he the suffering. Sam claimed to be a very backward, cautious, unadventurous boy. But this modest estimate is subject to modification when we learn that once he jumped off a two-story stable, another time he gave an elephant a plug of tobacco and retired without waiting for an answer, and still another time he pretended to be talking in his sleep and got off a portion of every original conundrum in hearing of his father. 
he begs the curious not to pry into the result as it was of no consequence to any one but himself the cave so graphically described in tom sawyer was one of sam's favorite haunts and his first sweetheart was laura hawkins the becky thatcher of tom's admiration sam was always up to some mischief this lady once remarked in later life when in reminential mood we attended sunday school together and they had a system of rewards for saying verses after committing them to memory a blue ticket was given for ten verses a red ticket for ten blue a yellow for ten red and a bible for ten yellow tickets if you will count up you will see it makes a bible for ten thousand verses sam came up one day with his ten yellow tickets and everybody knew he had not said a verse but had just got them by trading with the boys but he received his bible with all the serious air of a diligent student mark twain save when in humorous vein has never pretended that his success was due to any marvelous qualities of mind any indefatigable industry any innate energy and perseverance i have good reason to recall his favorite theory which he was fond of expounding to the effect that circumstance is man's master he likened circumstance to the attraction of gravity and declared that while it is man's privilege to argue with circumstance as it is the honorable privilege of the falling body to argue with the attraction of gravity it does no good man has to obey circumstance has as its working partner man's temperament his natural disposition temperament is not the creation of man but an innate quality over it he has no authority for its acts he cannot be held responsible it cannot be permanently changed or even modified no power can keep it modified for it is inherent and enduring as unchanging as the lines upon the thumb or the conformation of the skull throughout his life circumstance seemed like a watchful spirit switching his temperament into those channels of experience and development leading unerringly to the career of the author the death of judge clemens was the first link in the long chain of circumstance for his son was at once taken from school and apprenticed to the editor and proprietor of the hannibal courier he was allowed the usual emolument of the office apprentice board and clothes but no money and even at that though the board was paid the clothes rarely materialized several weeks later his brother orion returned to hannibal and in eighteen fifty brought out a little paper called the hannibal journal he took sam out of the courier office and engaged him for the journal at three dollars and fifty cents a week though he was never able to pay a cent of the wages one of mark's fellow townsmen once confessed yes i knew him when he was a boy he was a printer's devil i think that's what they called him and they didn't miss it at a banquet some years ago mark twain aptly described at length his experiences as a printer's apprentice there were a thousand and one menial services he was called upon to perform if the subscribers paid at all it was only sometimes and then the town subscribers paid in groceries the country subscribers in cabbages and cordwood if they paid they were puffed in the paper and if the editor forgot to insert the puff the subscriber stopped the paper every subscriber regarded himself as assistant editor ex officio gave orders as to how the paper was to be edited supplied it with opinions and directed its policy of course every time the editor failed to follow his suggestions he revenged himself by stopping the paper after some financial stress the paper was moved into the clemens home a two-story brick and here for several years it managed to worry along spasmodically hovering between life and death life was easy with the editors of that paper for if they pied a form they suspended until the next week they always suspended anyhow every now and then 
when the fishing was good, and always fell back upon the illness of the editor as a convenient excuse. Mark admitted that this was a paltry excuse, for the all-sufficing reason that a paper of that sort was just as well off with a sick editor as a well one, and better off with a dead one than with either of them. At the age of fifteen he considered himself a skilled journeyman printer, and his faculty for comedic portrayal had already betrayed itself in occasional clumsy efforts. In My First Literary Venture he narrates his experiences, among others, how greatly he increased the circulation of the paper, and incensed the inveterate woman-killer whose poetry for that week's paper read, To Mary in H. Hannibal. Mark added a snappy footnote at the bottom, in which he agreed to let the thing pass for just that once, but distinctly warning Mr. J. Gordon Runnels that the paper had a character to sustain, and that in future, when Mr. Runnels wanted to commune with his friends in H. Blank L., he must select some other medium for that communication. Many were the humorous skits, crudely illustrated with cuts made from wooden blocks hacked out with his jackknife, which the mischievous young devil inserted in his brother's paper. Here we may discern the first spontaneous outcroppings of the genuine humorist. It was on this paper, the Hannibal Journal, says his biographer, Mr. Albert B. Payne, that young Sam Clemens began his writings, burlesques as a rule, of local characters and conditions, usually published in his brother's absence, generally resulting in trouble on his return. Yet they made the paper sell, and if Orion had but realized his possession, he might have turned his brother's talent into capital even then. One evening in 1858, the boy, consumed with wanderlust, asked his mother for five dollars to start on his travels. He failed to receive the money, but he defiantly announced that he would go anyhow. He had managed to save a tiny sum, and that night he disappeared and fled to St. Louis. There he worked in the composing room of the evening news for a time, and then started out to see the world, New York, where a little world's fair was in progress. He was somewhat better off than was Benjamin Franklin when he entered Philadelphia, for he had two or three dollars in pocket change and a ten-dollar bank bill concealed in the lining of his coat. For a time he sweltered in a villainous mechanics boarding house in Duane Street and worked at starvation wages in the printing office of Gray and Green. Being recognized one day by a man from Hannibal, he fled to Philadelphia, where he worked for some months as a sub on the Inquirer and the Public Ledger. Next came a flying trip to Washington to see the sights there, and then back he went to Mississippi Valley. This journey to the vague and fabled East really opened his eyes to the great possibilities that the world has in store for the traveler. Meantime Orion had gone to Muscatine, Ohio, and acquired a small interest there and after his marriage he and his wife went to Keokuk and started a little job printing office. Here Sam worked with his brother until the winter of 1856-7, when circumstance once again played the part of Good Fairy. As he was walking along the street one snowy evening his attention was attracted by a piece of paper which the wind had blown against the wall. It proved to be a fifty-dollar bill, and after advertising for the owner for four days, he stealthily moved to Cincinnati in order to take that money out of danger. Now comes the second crucial event in his life. For long the ambition for river life had remained with him, and now there seemed some possibility of realizing these ambitions. He first went to be a cabin boy, then his ideal was to be a deckhand, because of his splendid conspicuousness as he stood on the end of the stage plank with a coil of rope in his hand. But these were only daydreams. He didn't admit, even to himself, that they were anything more than heavenly impossibilities. But as he worked during the winter in the printing office of Wrightson & Company of Cincinnati, 
he whiled away his leisure hours reading lieutenant herndon's account of his explorations of the amazon and became greatly interested in his description of the cocoa industry now he set to work to map out a new and thrilling career the expedition sent out by the government to explore the amazon had encountered difficulties and left unfinished the exploration of the country about the head waters thousands of miles from the mouth of the river it mattered not to him that new orleans was fifteen hundred miles away from cincinnati and that he had only thirty dollars left his mind was made up he would go on and complete the work of exploration so in april eighteen fifty seven he set sail for new orleans on an ancient tub called the paul jones for the paltry sum of sixteen dollars he was enabled to revel in the unimagined glories of the main saloon at last he was under way realizing his boyhood dream unable to contain himself for joy at last he saw himself as that hero of his boyish fancy a traveler when he reached new orleans after the prolonged ecstasy of two weeks on a tiny mississippi steamer he discovered that no ship was leaving for para that there never had been one leaving for para and that there probably would not be one leaving for para that century a policeman made him move on threatening to run him in if he ever caught him reflecting in the public street again just as his money failed him his old friend circumstance arrived with another turning point in his life a new link on his way down the river he had met horace bixby he turned to him in this hour of need it has been charged against mark twain that he was deplorably lazy apocryphal anecdotes are still narrated with much gusto to prove it think of a lazy boy undertaking the stupendous task of learning to know the intricate and treacherous secrets of the great river to know every foot of the route in the dark as well as he knew his own face in the glass and yet he confesses that he was unaware of the immensity of the undertaking upon which he had embarked in eighteen fifty two says bixby i was chief pilot on the paul jones a boat that made occasional trips from pittsburg to new orleans one day a tall angular hoosier-like young fellow whose limbs appeared to be fastened with leather hinges entered the pilot house and in a peculiar drawling voice said good morning sir don't you want to take your peart young fellow and teach him how to be your pilot no sir there is more bother about it than it's worth i wish you would mister i'm a er printer by trade but it don't appear to agree with me and i'm on my way to central america for my health i believe i'll make a tolerable good pilot cause i like the river what makes you pull your words that way i don't know mister you'll have to ask my ma she pulls hern too ain't there some way that we can fix it so that you'll teach me how to be her pilot the only way is for money how much are you going to charge well i'll teach you the river for five hundred dollars gee willikins <laughs> i ain't got five hundred dollars but i've got five lots in keokuk iowa and two thousand acres of land in tennessee that is worth two bits an acre any time you can have that if you want it i told him i did not care for his land and after a while he agreed to pay one hundred dollars in cash borrowed from his brother-in-law william a moffett of virginia one hundred and fifty dollars in twelve months and the balance when he became a pilot he was with me for a long time but sometimes 
took occasional trips with other pilots and he significantly adds he was always drawling out dry jokes but then we did not pay any attention to him it cannot be thought accidental that sam clemens became a pilot bixby became his mentor the pilot house his recitation room the steamboat his university the great river the field of knowledge in that stupendous course in nature's own college he learned the river as schoolboy seldom masters his greek or his mathematics with the naive assurance of youth he gaily enters upon the task of learning some twelve or thirteen hundred miles of the great mississippi long afterwards he confessed that had he really known what he was about to require of his faculties he would never have had the courage to begin his comic sketches published in the hannibal weekly courier in his brother's absence furnish the first link his apprenticeship to bixby the second link in the chain of circumstance for two years and a half he sailed the river as a master pilot his trustworthiness secured for him the command of some of the best boats on the river and he was so skillful that he never met disaster on any of his trips he narrowly escaped it in eighteen sixty one for when louisiana seceded his boat was drafted into the confederate service as he reached st louis having taken passage for home a shell came whizzing by and carried off part of the pilot house it was the end of an era the civil war had begun the occupation of the pilot was gone but the river had given up to him all of its secrets he was to show them to a world in life on the mississippi and huckleberry finn the story of the derivation of the famous nom de guerre has often been narrated and as often erroneously as the steamboat approaches a sandbank snag or other obstruction the man at the bow heaves the lead and sings out by the mark three mark twain etc meaning three fathoms deep two fathoms and so on the thought of adopting mark twain as a nom de guerre was not original with clemens but the world owes him a debt of gratitude for making forever famous a name that but for him would have been forever lost there was a man a captain isaiah sellers who furnished river news for the new orleans picayune still one of the best papers in the south mr clemens once confessed to professor william l phelps he used to sign his articles mark twain he died in eighteen sixty three i liked the name and stole it i think i have done him no wrong for i seem to have made this name somewhat generally known the inglorious escapade of his military career at which he himself has poked unspeakable fun and for which not even his most enthusiastic biographers have any excuse was soon ended had his heart really been enlisted on the side of the south he would doubtless have stayed at his post in reality he was at that time lacking in conviction and in after life he became a thorough unionist and abolitionist in the summer of eighteen sixty one governor jackson of missouri called for fifty thousand volunteers to drive out the union forces while visiting in the small town where his boyhood had been spent hannibal marion county young clemens and some of his friends met together in a secret place one night and formed themselves into a military company the spirited but untrained tom lyman was made captain and in lieu of a first lieutenant strange omission young clemens was made second lieutenant these fifteen hardy souls proudly dubbed themselves the marion rangers no one thought of finding fault with such a name it sounded too well all were full of notions as high-flown as the name of their company one of their number named dunlap was ashamed of his name because it had a plebeian sound to his ear 
so he solved the difficulty and gratified his aristocratic ambitions by writing it de unlap this may serve as a sample of the stuff of which the company was made dunlap was by no means useless for he invented highfalutin names for the camps and generally succeeded in proposing a name that was as his companions agreed no slouch there was no real organization nobody obeyed orders there was never a battle they retreated according to the tale of the humorist at every sign of the enemy in truth this little band had plenty of stomach for fighting despite its loose organization and quite a number fought all through the war mark twain is doubtless correct in the main in his assertion that he has not given an unfair picture of the conditions prevailing in many of the militia camps in the first months of the war between the states the men were raw and unseasoned and even the leaders were lacking in the rudiments of military training and discipline the situation was strange and unprecedented the terrors were none the less real that they were imaginary as mark says it took an actual collision with the enemy on the field of battle to change them from rabbits into soldiers young clemens according to his nephew's account was first detailed to special duty on the river because of his knowledge acquired as a pilot it was not long before he was captured and paroled again he was captured this time sent to st louis and imprisoned there in a tobacco warehouse fearing recognition and tragic consequences perhaps court-martial and death should he during the formalities of exchange be recognized by the command in grant's army which first captured him he made his escape abandoned the cause which he afterwards spoke of as the rebellion and went west as secretary to his brother orion lately appointed territorial secretary of nevada by the president a very credible and interesting biography of mark twain might be compiled from his own works and roughing it is full of autobiography of a colored sort though in the main correct his joy in the prospect of that trip the exciting details of the long journey are all narrated with gusto and fine effect in the unique sinecure of the office of private secretary he found he had nothing to do and no salary so after a short time the fear of being recognized by union soldiers and shot for breaking his parole still haunting him he and a companion went off together on a fishing jaunt to lake tahoe everywhere he saw fortunes made in a moment he fell a prey to the prevailing excitement and went mad like all the rest little wonder over the wild talk when cartloads of solid silver bricks as large as pigs of lead were passing by every day before their very eyes the wild talk grew more frenzied from day to day and young clemens yielded to no one in enthusiasm and excitement for vividness or picturesqueness of expression none could vie with him with three companions he began prospecting with the most indifferent success and soon tiring of their situation they moved on down to esmeralda now aurora on the other side of carson city here new life seemed to inspire the party what mattered it if they were in debt to the butcher for did they not own thirty thousand feet apiece in the richest mines on earth who cared if their credit was not good with the grocer so long as they reveled in mountains of fictitious wealth and raved in the frenzied cant of the hour over their immediate prospect of fabulous riches but at last the practical necessities of living put a sudden damper on their enthusiasm clemens was forced at last to abandon mining and go to work as a common laborer in a quartz mill at ten dollars a week and board after flour had soared to a dollar a pound and the rate on borrowed money had gone to eight per cent a month this work was very exhausting and after a week clemens asked his employer for an advance of wages the employer replied that he was paying clemens ten dollars a week and thought that all he was worth how much did he want when clemens replied that four hundred thousand dollars a month and board was all he could reasonably ask considering the hard times he was ordered off the premises in after days 
Mark only regretted that, in view of the arduous labors he had performed in that mill, he had not asked seven hundred thousand for his services. After a time, Mark and his friend Higby established their claim to a mine, became mad with excitement, and indulged in the wildest dreams for the future. Under the laws of the district, work of a certain character must be done upon the claim within ten days after location in order to establish the right of possession. Mark was called away to the bedside of a sick friend. Higby failed to receive Mark's note, and the work was never done, each thinking it was being properly attended to by the other. On their return they discovered that their claim was relocated, and that millions had slipped from their grasp. The very stars in their courses seemed to fight to force young Clemens into literature. Had Samuel Clemens become a millionaire at this time, it is virtually certain that there would have been no Mark Twain. After one day more of heartless prospecting, Clemens dropped in at the wayside post office. It was the hour of fate. A letter awaited him there. We cannot call it accident. It was the result of forces and events which had long been converging toward this end. Samuel Clemens began his career as an itinerant, tramping jour printer. He wrote for the papers on which he served as printer, and he actually read the matter he set up in type. By observation on his travels, by study of the writing of others, Clemens acquired information, knowledge of life, and ingenuity of expression. He hadn't served his ten years' apprenticeship as a printer for nothing. In the process of setting up tons of good and bad literature, he had learned, half unconsciously, to appraise and to discriminate. In the same half unconscious way, he was actually gaining some inkling of the niceties of style. After he began learning the river, Clemens once wrote a funny sketch about Captain Sellers, which made a genuine hit with the officers on the boat. The sketch fell into the hands of the river editor of the St. Louis Republican, found a place in that journal, and was widely copied throughout the West. On the strength of it, Clemens became a sort of river reporter, and from time to time published memoranda and comic squibs in the Republican. That passion which a French critic has characterized as distinctively American, the passion for seeing yourself in print, still burned in Clemens even during all the hardships of prospecting and milling. At intervals he sent from the mining regions of Washu, as all that part of Nevada was then called, humorous letters signed Josh to the daily territorial enterprise of Virginia City, at that time one of the most progressive and wide-awake newspapers in the West. The fateful letter which I have mentioned contained an offer to Clemens from the proprietor of the Enterprise, of the position of city editor, at a salary of twenty-five dollars a week. To Clemens at this time this offer came as a perfect godsend. Twenty-five dollars a week was nothing short of wealth, luxury. His enthusiasm oozed away when he reflected over his ignorance and incompetence and he gloomily recalled his repeated failures. But necessity faced him, and opportunity knocks but once at every door. His doubts were speedily resolved, and he afterwards confessed that, had he been offered at that time a salary to translate the Talmud from the original Hebrew, he would unhesitatingly have accepted, despite some natural misgivings and have tried to throw as much variety into it as he could for the money. It was to fill a vacancy caused by the absence of Dan de Quill, the regular reporter, on a visit to the States, that Clemens was offered this position. But he retained it after de Quill returned. Mark and I had our hands full, relates de Quill, and no grass grew under our feet. There was a constant rush of startling events. They came tumbling over one another, as though playing at leapfrog. While a stage robbery was being written up, a shooting affray started, and, perhaps before the pistol shots had ceased to echo among the surrounding hills, the fire bells were banging out an alarm. A record of the variegated duties of these two, found in an old copy of the Territorial Enterprise of 1863, 
bears the unmistakable hallmarks of Mark Twain. Our duty is to keep the universe thoroughly posted concerning murders and street fights and balls and theaters and pack trains and churches and lectures and schoolhouses and city military affairs and highway robberies and bible societies and hay wagons and a thousand other things which it is within the province of local reporters to keep track of and magnify into undue importance for the instruction of the readers of a great daily newspaper beyond this revelation everything connected with these two experiments of providence must forever remain an impenetrable mystery an admirable picture of mark twain on his native heath in the latter part of eighteen sixty three is given by edward perrin hingston author of the genial showman in the introduction to the english edition of the innocents abroad the fame of the western humorist had already reached the ears of hingston and as soon as he reached virginia city he went to the office of the territorial enterprise and asked to be presented to mark twain when he heard his name called by someone clemens called out pass the gentleman into my den the noble animal is here the noble animal proved to be a young man strongly built ruddy in complexion his hair of a sunny hue his eyes light and twinkling in manner hearty and nothing of the student about him one who looked as if he could take his own part in a quarrel strike a smart blow as readily as he could stay a telling thing bluffly jolly brusquely cordial off-handedly good-natured the picture is detailed and vivid let it be borne in mind that from the windows of the newspaper office the american desert was visible that within a radius of ten miles indians were encamping amongst the sage-brush that the whole city was populated with miners adventurers jew traders gamblers and all the rough-and-tumble class which a mining town in a new territory collects together and it will be readily understood that a reporter for a daily paper in such a place must neither go about his duties wearing light kid gloves nor be fastidious about having gilt edges to his notebooks in mark twain i found the very man i had expected to see a flower of the wilderness tinged with the color of the soil the man of thought and the man of action rolled into one humorist and hard worker momus in a felt hat and jackboots in the reporter of the territorial enterprise i became introduced to a california celebrity rich in eccentricities of thought lively in fancy quaint in remark whose residence upon the fringe of civilization had allowed his humor to develop without restraint and his speech to be rarely idiomatic under the influence of the example of the proprietors of the enterprise strict stylistic disciplinarians of the dana school of journalism clemens learned the advantages of the crisp direct style which characterizes his writing as a reporter he was really industrious in matters that met his fancy but cast-iron items for he hated facts and figures requiring absolute accuracy got from him only a lick and a promise he was much interested in tom fitch's effort to establish a literary journal the weekly occidental daggett's opening chapters of a wonderful story of which fitch mrs fitch j t goodman dan de quill and clemens were to write successive installments gave that paper the coup de grace in its very first issue of this wonderful novel at the close of each installment of which the hero was left in a position of such peril that it seemed impossible he could be rescued 
except through means and wisdom more than human of the bohemian days of the visigoths clemens de quill frank may lewis aldrich and their confreres of the practical jokes played on each other particularly the incident of the imitation meerschaum mere sham pipe solemnly presented to clemens by steve gillis c a v putnam d e mccarthy de quill and others all these belong to the fascinating domain of the biographer when clemens was sent down to carson city to report the meetings of the first nevada legislature he began for the first time to sign his letters mark twain in his autobiography he has explained that his function as a legislative correspondent was to dispense compliment and censure with impartial justice as his disquisitions covered about half a page each morning in the enterprise it is easy to understand that he was an influence questioned by carlyle smith in regard to his choice of mark twain mr clemens replied i chose my pseudonym because to nine hundred and ninety-nine persons out of a thousand it had no meaning and also because it was short i was a reporter in the legislature at the time and i wished to save the legislature time it was much shorter to say in their debates for i was certain to be the occasion of some questions of privilege mark twain than the unprincipled and lying parliamentary reporter of the territorial enterprise already his name was known the whole length of the pacific coast the enterprise published many things from his pen which gave him local and afterwards national fame such sketches as the undertaker's chat the petrified man the marvelous bloody massacre had attracted favorable and wide notice east of the rocky mountains but his career in carson city came to a sudden close when he challenged the editor of the virginia union to a duel the bloodless conclusion of which is narrated in the autobiography but even a challenge to a duel was against the new law of nevada and obeying the warning of governor north the duelists crossed the border without ceremony and stood not upon the order of their going while mark twain was still with the enterprise he was in the habit of reserving all his sketches for the san francisco newspapers the golden era and the morning call he now turns his steps to that storied city of frisco and was not long in extending his fame on that coast he was incorrigibly lazy as george barnes the editor of the call soon discovered and kipling was told when he was in san francisco that mark was in the habit of coiling himself into a heap and meditating until the last minute when he would produce copy having no relationship to the subject of his assignment which made the editor swear horribly and the readers of the call ask for more his love for practical joking during the california days brought him unpopularity and one reads in a san francisco paper of the early days there have been moments in the lives of various kind-hearted and respectable citizens of california and nevada when if mark twain were before them as members of a vigilance committee for any mild crime such as mule stealing or arson it is to be feared his shrift would have been short what a dramatic picture the idea conjures up to be sure mark before these honest men infuriated by his practical jokes trying to show them what an innocent creature he was when it came to mules or how the only policy of fire insurance he held had lapsed how void of guile he was in any direction and all with that inimitable drawl that perplexed countenance and peculiar scraping of the left foot like a boy speaking his first piece at school 
if he just escaped disaster he likewise just escaped millions on one occasion for the space of a few moments he owned the famous comstock load which was though he never suspected it worth millions his trunk full of securities which were eminently saleable at one time proved to be of fictitious value when the bottom dropped out of the nevada boom and that silver mine which he was commissioned to sell in new york was finally sold for three million dollars it was as mark says the blind led over again mark twain had the true midas touch but the mine of riches he was destined to discover was a mine not of gold or silver but the mine of intellect and rich human experience to the golden era mark twain like prentice mulford and joaquin miller contributed freely and after a time he became associated with bret hart on the californian hart as editor at twenty dollars a week and mark receiving twelve dollars for an article here foregathered that group of brilliant writers of the pacific slope numbering bret hart mark twain charles warren stoddard charles henry webb and prentice mulford among its celebrities two of that remarkable coterie were soon destined to achieve world-wide fame these ingenious young men with the fatuity of gifted people says mr howells had established a literary newspaper in san francisco and they brilliantly cooperated in its early extinction of his first meeting with mark twain bret hart has left a memorable picture his head was striking he had the curly hair the aquiline nose and even the aquiline eye an eye so eagle-like that a second lid would not have surprised me of an unusual and dominant nature his eyebrows were very thick and bushy his dress was careless and his general manner was one of supreme indifference to surroundings and circumstances barnes introduced him as mr sam clemens and remarked that he had shown a very unusual talent in a number of newspaper articles contributed over the signature of mark twain mark tired of the life of literary drudgery in san francisco on one occasion he was reduced to a solitary ten cent piece and general john mccomb wooed him back to journalism just as he was on the point of returning to his old work on the mississippi river this time as a government pilot during the earlier years in san francisco he was in the habit of writing weekly letters to the territorial enterprise personals market chat and the like but when he criticized the police department of san francisco in the most scathing terms the officials found means for bringing charges that made the author's presence there difficult and comfortless so he welcomed the opportunity to join steve gillis in a pilgrimage to the mountain home of jim gillis his brother a sort of bohemian infirmary mark twain reveled in the delightful company of the original of bret hart's truthful james and he enjoyed the mining methods of jackass hill like the true bohemian that he was soon after his arrival mark and jim gillis started out in search of golden pockets as de quill says they soon found and spent some days in working up the undisturbed trail of an undiscovered deposit they were on the golden bee-line and stuck to it faithfully though it was necessary to carry each sample of dirt a considerable distance to a small stream in the bed of a cannon in order to wash it however mark hungered and thirsted to find a big rich pocket and he pitched in after the manner of joe bowers of old just like a thousand of brick each step made sure by the finding of golden grains they at last came upon the pocket whence these grains had trailed out down the slope of the mountain it was a cold dreary drizzling day when the home deposit was found the first sample of dirt carried to the stream and washed out yielded only a few cents although the right vein had been discovered they had as yet found only the tail end of the pocket returning to the vein 
they dug a sample of the decomposed ore from a new place and were about to carry it down to the ravine and test it when the rain increased to a lively downpour mark was chilled to the bone and refused to carry another pail of water in slow drawling tones he protested decisively jim i won't carry any more water this work is too disagreeable let's go to the house and wait till it clears up gillis was eager to test the sample he had just taken out bring just one more pail sam he urged i won't do it jim replied the now thoroughly disgusted clemens not a drop not if i knew there were a million dollars in that pan moved by sam's dejected appearance blue nose and humped back and realizing doubtless that it was futile to reason with him further jim yielded and emptied the sacks of dirt just dug upon the ground they now started out for the nearest shelter the hotel in angel's camp kept by coon drayden formerly a mississippi river pilot imagine the jests and shouts that went around as mark and coon vied with each other in narrating interesting experiences for three days the rain and the stories held out and among those told by drayton was a story of a frog he narrated this story with the utmost solemnity as a thing that had happened in angel's camp in the spring of forty nine the story of a frog trained by its owner to become a wonderful jumper but which failed to make good in a contest because the owner of a rival frog in order to secure the winning of the wager filled the trained frog full of shot during its owner's absence this story appealed irresistibly to mark as a first-rate story told in a first-rate way he divined in it the magic quality unsuspected by the narrator universal humor he made notes in order to remember the story and on his return to gillis's cabin wrote it up he wrote a number of other things besides all of which he valued above the frog story but gillis thought it the best thing he had ever written meantime the rain had washed off the surface soil from their last pan which they had left in their hurry some passing miners were astonished to behold the ground glittering with gold they appropriated it but dared not molest the deposit until the expiration of the thirty-day claim notice posted by jim gillis they sat down to wait hoping that the claimants would not return at the expiration of the thirty days the claim jumpers took possession and soon cleared out the pocket which yielded twenty thousand dollars it was one of the most fortunate accidents in mark twain's career he came within one pail of water of comparative wealth but had he discovered that pocket he would probably have settled down as a pocket miner and might have pounded quartz for the rest of his life had his nerve held out a moment longer he would never have gone to angel's camp would never have heard the story of the jumping frog and would have escaped that sudden fame which this little story soon brought him on his return to san francisco he dropped in one morning to see bret hart and told him this story as hart records he spoke in a slow rather satirical drawl which was in itself irresistible he went on to tell one of those extravagant stories and half unconsciously dropped into the lazy tone and manner of the original narrator i asked him to tell it again to a friend who came in and they asked him to write it for the californian he did so and when published it was an emphatic success it was the first work of his that had attracted general attention and it crossed the sierras for an eastern reading the story was the jumping frog of calaveras it is now known and laughed over i suppose wherever the english language is spoken but it will never be as funny to anyone in print as it was to me told for the first time by the unknown twain himself on that morning in the san francisco mint 
When Artemus Ward passed through California on a literary tour in 1864, Mark Twain regaled him, as he regaled all worthy acquaintances, with his favorite story, The Jumping Frog. Ward was delighted with it. "'Write it out,' he said. "'Give it all the necessary touches, and let me use it in a volume of sketches I am preparing for the press. Just send it to Carlton, my publisher in New York.' It arrived too late for Ward's book, and Carleton presented it to Henry Clapp, who published it in his paper, The Saturday Press, of November 18, 1864. In his autobiography, Mr. Clemens has narrated how the jumping frog put a quietus on the Saturday Press, and was immediately copied in numerous newspapers in England and America. He was always proud of the celebrity that story achieved, but he never sought to claim the credit for himself. He freely admits that it was not Mark Twain, but the frog that became celebrated. The author, alas, remained in obscurity. Carleton afterwards confessed that he had lost the chance of a lifetime by giving the jumping frog away, but Mark Twain's old friend Charles Henry Webb came to the rescue and published it. About 4,000 copies were sold in three years, but the real fame of the story was in its newspaper and magazine notoriety. In 1872 it was translated into the Revue des Deux Mondes, and it was almost as widely read in England, India, and Australia as it was in America. Meantime Mark Twain was still awaiting the rewards of journalism and doing literary hack-work of one sort or another. In 1866 the proprietors of the Sacramento Union employed him to write a series of letters from the Sandwich Islands. The purpose of these letters was to give an account of the sugar industry. Mark told the story of sugar, but, as was his wont, threw in a lot of extraneous matter that had nothing to do with sugar. It was the extraneous matter, and not the sugar, that won him a wide audience on the Pacific coast. During these months of luxurious vagrancy, he described in the most vivid way many of the most notable features of the Sandwich Islands. Nowadays such letters would at once have been embodied in a volume. In his My Debut as a Literary Person, Mark Twain has described in admirable graphic style his great scoop of the news of the Hornet disaster. How Anson Burlingame had him, ill though he was, carried on a cot to the hospital, so that he could interview the half-dead sailors. His bill, twenty dollars a week for general correspondence and one hundred dollars a column for the hornet story was paid with all good will on the strength of this story he hoped to become a literary person and sent his account of the hornet disaster to harper's magazine where it appeared in december eighteen sixty six but alas he could not give the banquet he was going to give to celebrate his debut as a literary person he had not written the Mark Twain distinctly, and when it appeared it had been transformed into Mike Swain. End of The Man Part One This is Section 3 of Mark Twain by Archibald Henderson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Man Part Two when Mark returned to San Francisco, he resolved to follow the example of Stoddart and Mulford and enter the lecture field. The extraneous matter, in his letters to the Sacramento Union, had made him notorious, and as he put it, San Francisco invited me to lecture. The historic account of that lecture in Roughing It is found elsewhere in this book. Noah Brooks, editor of the Alta California, who was present at this lecture, has written the following graphic piece of description. Mark Twain's method as a lecturer was distinctly unique and novel. His slow, deliberate drawl, the anxious and perturbed expression of his visage, the apparently painful effort with which he framed his sentences, and, above all, the surprise that spread over his face when the audience roared with delight or rapturously applauded the finer passages of his word-painting 
were unlike anything of the kind they had ever known all this was original it was mark twain employing d e mccarthy as his agent mark twain gave a number of lectures at various places on the pacific coast from this time forward we recognize in mark twain one of the supreme masters of the art of lecturing in our time in december eighteen sixty six he set out for new york preparatory to the grand tour around the world his own account of the circular describing the projected trip is famous he had proposed for twelve hundred dollars in gold at the rate of twenty dollars apiece to write a series of letters for the alta california brooks the editor fortified the grave misgivings of the proprietors over this proposition but colonel john mccomb then on the editorial staff argued vehemently for mark and turned the scale in his favor while mark was in new york he was urged by frank fuller whom he had known as territorial governor of utah to deliver a lecture in order to establish his reputation on the atlantic coast fuller an enthusiastic admirer of mark twain overcame all objections and engaged cooper union for the occasion though few tickets were sold fuller cleverly succeeded in packing the hall by sending out a multitude of complimentary tickets to the school teachers of new york city and the adjacent territory that lecture proved to be a supreme success mark's reputation as a lecturer on the atlantic coast was assured on june tenth eighteen sixty seven the quaker city set sail for its oriental tour it bore on board a comparatively unknown person of the name of clemens who in applying for passage represented himself to be a baptist minister in ill health from san francisco it brought back a celebrity destined to become famous throughout the world prior to sailing he arranged to contribute letters to the new york tribune and the new york herald as well as to the alta california his letters to the alta california says noah brooks made him famous it was my business to prepare one of these letters for the sunday morning paper taking the topmost letter from a goodly pile that was stacked in a pigeonhole of my desk clemens was an indefatigable correspondent and his last letter was slipped in at the bottom of a tall stack it would not be quite accurate to say that mark twain's letters were the talk of the town but it was very rarely that readers of the paper did not come into the office on mondays to confide to the editors their admiration of the writer and their enjoyment of his weekly contributions the california newspapers copied these letters with unanimous approval and disregard of the copyrights of author and publisher it was the western humor and the quaintly untrammeled american intelligence focused upon diverse and age-encrusted civilizations which caught the instantaneous fancy of a vast public it was a virgin field for the humorous observer europe had not yet become the playground of america it was rather a terra incognita regarded with a sort of reverential ignorance by the average american tourist by the range of his humor the pertinency of his observation and the vigor of his expression he awoke immediate attention and he aroused a deeply sympathetic response in the hearts of americans by his manly and outspoken expression his respect for the worthy the admirable the praiseworthy his scorn and detestation for the spurious the specious and the fraudulent in this book for the first time he strikes the keynote of his life and thought which sounds so clearly throughout all his later works it is the true beginning of his career on his return to the united states in november he resumed his newspaper work this time at the national capital on his arrival there he found a letter from elisha bliss of the american publishing company proposing a volume recounting the adventures of the excursion 
to be elaborately illustrated and sold by subscription on a five per cent royalty he eagerly accepted the offer and set to work on his notes i knew mark twain in washington says senator william m stewart of nevada in his reminiscences a senator of the sixties at a time when he was without money he told me his condition and said he was very anxious to get out his book he showed me his notes and i saw that they would make a great book and probably bring him in a fortune i promised that i would stake him until he had the book written i made him a clerk to my committee in the senate which paid him six dollars a day then i hired a man for one hundred dollars per month to do the work his mischievously extravagant description of mark twain at this time is eminently worthy of record he was arrayed in a seedy suit which hung upon his lean frame in bunches with no style worth mentioning a sheaf of scraggly black hair leaked out of a battered old slouch hat like stuffing from an ancient colonial sofa and an evil-smelling cigar butt very much frazzled protruded from the corner of his mouth he had a very sinister appearance he was a man i had known around the nevada mining camps several years before and his name was samuel l clemens it was during this winter that mark wrote a number of humorous articles and sketches the facts in the case of the great beef contract the account of his resignation as clerk of the senate committee on conchology and riley newspaper correspondent his time was chiefly devoted to preparing the material for his book but finding washington too distracting he returned to san francisco and completed the manuscript there in july eighteen sixty eight for a year the publication of the book was delayed as recorded in the autobiography but it finally appeared in print following mark's indignant telegram to bliss that if the book was not on sale in twenty-four hours he would bring suit for damages mark twain records that in nine months the book had taken the publishing house out of debt advanced its stock from twenty-five to two hundred and left seventy thousand dollars clear profit eighty-five thousand copies were sold within sixteen months the largest sale of a four-dollar book ever achieved in america in so short a time up to that date it is miraculous to relate still the leader in its own special field a best-seller for forty years the proprietors of the alta california were exceeding wroth when they heard that clemens was preparing for publication the very letters which they had commissioned him to write and had printed in their own paper they prepared to publish a cheap paper-covered edition of the letters and sent the american publishing company a challenge in the shape of an advance notice of their publication clemens hurried back to san francisco from the east and soon convinced the proprietors of the alta california of the authenticity of his copyright the paper covered edition was then and there abandoned forever before leaving the west to settle permanently in the east mark twain was associated for a short time with the overland monthly edited by bret hart in his review of the innocents abroad hart asserted that clemens deserved to rank foremost among western humorists but he was grievously disappointed in the first few contributions from clemens to the overland monthly notably by rail through france later incorporated in the innocents abroad because of their perfect gravity at last a medieval romance a story which has been said to contain the germ of a connecticut yankee because of its burlesque of medievalism won the enthusiastic approval of bret hart from this time forward samuel l clemens is seen in a new environment in association with new ideas and a new civilization the history of this second period does not fall within the scope of the present work it has just been narrated with brilliancy and charm by his close associate and most intimate friend 
Mr. William Dean Howells, in his admirable book, My Mark Twain. In the subsequent portion of the present work, attention will be directed solely to those features of Mark Twain's life which have a direct bearing upon his career as a man of letters, and which throw into relief the progressive development of his genius. The South and the West contributed to Mark Twain's development, and added to his store of vital experience, in greater measure than all the other influences of his life combined. From the inexhaustible well of those experiences he drew ever fresh contributions for the satisfaction of the world. His mind was stocked with the rich, crude ore of early experience, the romance and the reality of a life full of prismatic variations of color. The civilization of the East, its culture and refinement, tempered the genius of Mark Twain in conformity with the indispensable criteria of classic art. Under the broadening influence of its persistent nationalism, he became more deeply, more profoundly imbued with the comprehensive ideals of American democracy. He never lost the first fine virginal spontaneity of his native style, never weakened in the vigor of his thought or in the primitiveness of his expression. His contact with the East compassed the liberation of that vast fund of stored-up early experiences acquired through grappling with life in many a rude encounter. Out of its own life the East never contributed to Mark Twain's works in any appreciably momentous way, either volume or immensity of fertile, suggestive human experience. If we eliminate from the list of Mark Twain's works those books which have their roots deep-set in the soil of South and West, we eliminate the most priceless assets of his art. Indeed, it may be doubted whether, were those works struck from the catalogue of his contributions, Mark Twain could justly rank as a great genius. To his association with the South and the Southwest are due Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, Puddinhead Wilson, and Life on the Mississippi. The Jumping Frog and Roughing It belong peculiarly to the West, and even The Innocents Abroad falls wholly within the period of Mark Twain's influence by the West, its standards, outlook, and localized viewpoint. Colonel Mulberry Sellers is a veritably human type, the embodiment, laughably lovable, of a temperamental phase of American character in the course of the national development, but the Gilded Age has long since disappeared from that small but tremendously significant group of works which are tentatively destined to rank as classics. Much as I enjoy the satiric comedy of A Yankee in King Arthur's Court, I have always felt that it set before Europe an American type which is neither elevating nor inspiring nor national. It tends to the gratification of England and Europe, even in the face of its democratic demolition of feudalistic survival, by sealing a certain cheap type of vulgarity with the national stamp. One must nevertheless confess with regret that this type is the embodiment of an ideal still only too commonly cherished in America. The national type, I take it, is found in such characters as Lincoln and Phillips Brooks, in Lee and Henry W. Grady, in Charles W. Eliot and Edwin A. Alderman, and not in a provincial Connecticut Yankee, jovial and wholehearted though he be. I say this without forgetting or minimizing for a moment the art displayed in effecting the devastating and illimitably humorous contrast of a present with a remotely past civilization. Joan of Arc has no local association, being a pure work of the heart, the chivalric impulse of a noble spirit. The man that corrupted Hadleyburg, viewed from any standpoint, is a masterpiece, but its significance lies not in the locality of its setting, but in the universality of its moral. In a word, it was the East which broadened and universalized the spirit of Mark Twain. We shall see later on that it steadily fostered in him a spirit of true nationalism and hardy democracy. But it was the South and the West 
which lavishly gave him of their most priceless riches and thereby created in mark twain a unique and incomparable genius the veritable type and embodiment of their inalienably individual life and civilization this first phase of the life of mark twain has been so strongly stressed here because the first half of his life has always seemed to me to have been a period of shall i say god-appointed preparation for the most significant and lastingly permanent work of the latter half namely the narration of the incidents of early experience and the imaginative reminting of the gold of that experience one has only to read mark twain's works to learn the real history of his life there were momentous episodes in the latter half of his career but they were concerned with his life rather than with his art we cannot indeed say what or how profound is the effect of life and experience on art there was the happy marriage the tragic losses of wife and children there were the associations with the culture and art circles of america and europe new england new york berlin vienna london glasgow the academic degrees missouri yale finally ancient oxford for the first time conferring the coveted honor of its degree upon a humorist the honors his own country delighted to bestow upon him and there too was that gallant struggle to pay off a tremendous debt begun at sixty and accomplished one year sooner than he expected after the most spectacular and remarkable lecture tour in history the beautiful chivalric spirit of this great soul shone brightest in disaster he insisted that it was his wife who refused to compromise his debts for forty cents on the dollar that it was she who declared it must be dollar for dollar and when a fund was raised by his admirers to assist in lightening his burden that it was his wife who refused to accept it though he was willing enough to accept it as a welcome relief as an american i can say nothing more significantly characteristic of the man than that he was a good citizen he possessed in the consciousness of personal responsibility for the standards government and ideals of his town his city and his country civic conscientiousness burned strong within him and he fought to develop and to maintain breadth of public view and sanity of popular ideals blind patriotism was impossible for this great american he exposed the shallowness of popular enthusiasms and the narrowness of rampant spread egoism without regard for consequence to himself or his popularity what a tribute to his personality that instead of suffering he gained in popularity by his honest and downright outspokenness he wielded the lash of his bitter scorn and fearful irony upon the wrongdoer the hypocrite the fraud and aroused public opinion to impatience with public abuse open offense and official discourtesy samuel langhorn clemens impressed me as the most complete and human individual i have ever known he was not a great thinker his views were not advanced the glory of his temperament was its splendid sanity balance and normality the homeliest virtues of life were his the republican virtue of simplicity the domestic virtue of personal purity and passionately simple regard for the sanctity of the marriage bond the civic virtue of public honesty the business virtue of stainless private honor mark twain was one of the supreme literary geniuses of his time but he was something even more than this he was not simply a great genius he was a great man end of the man read by john greenman